Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Alan Schroeder. I'm chair of the Pediatric Grand Rounds Committee uh, and very excited for today's session, which I will get to shortly. Uh, but first, some quick announcements. You can get CME credit for today's talk by texting the code to the number listed on the left here. This will also be placed in the chat. Uh, and upcoming Grand Rounds next week, we have a talk on virtual prep, uh, looking at access to HIV prevention by one of our own uh, scientists and, and clinicians, Dr. Jeffrey Hart Cooper. Uh, and following that, on March 26, we will have our child abuse team, Dr. Melissa Eggy uh, and Chris Stewart. Dr. Eggy has joined our faculty uh, in the last year or so, so really excited to have her and see how that program has grown. Next slide, please. We have our pediatric three-day retreat coming up uh, in mid-April. Uh, really excited for that. We have a, a fantastic lineup of speakers, as you can see here. Next slide. Here are the keynote is, is Dr. Manji and uh, a whole bunch of folks from the department, including a number of trainees, um, talking about their work over the last year. And I think uh, you can... Uh, Stop sharing now, Ingrid, thank you so much. And I'm gonna to introduce today's speakers who are gonna be telling us about uh, some of the really cool innovative device um, efforts here at Stanford. These are collaborative efforts uh, through a number of initiatives. When I, um, gosh, it must've been about eight years ago, uh, I heard Tom Crummel give grand rounds about the biodesign program here at Stanford. And it, and it was one of the most memorable grand rounds that I've seen here. It was just incredible to hear about the stuff that they're doing. And so I'm really excited to hear now, uh, eight years later or so, uh, about all of the new things that are being done. We have two fantastic speakers. The first speaker is going to be Dr. Janine Furch, who is a former uh, Packard resident. Uh, uh, seeing that you finished in 2013 was uh, sort of um, uh, eye-opening to me because it didn't seem like that long ago, uh, but she was one of our excellent residents who stayed on to be a neonatology uh, fellow here uh, and now is a clinical assistant professor and, and uh, heavily involved in the biodesign program in the UCSF Stanford Pediatric Device Consortium, um, also involved uh, in the CAPE program doing a lot of work in simulation here. Uh, she is joined by Dr. James Wall, uh, who is an associate professor in uh, pediatric surgery. Uh, he did his residency training at UCSF and then uh, had the privilege of going off to France to do a minimally invasive surgery fellowship at the ERCAT Institute. I think I might want to apply there soon. Uh, and then did, he came in and did his pediatric surgery fellowship here and has now stayed on to, to be faculty and similarly is, is very heavily involved in the leadership of the biodesign program and the UCSF Stanford Pediatric Device Consortium. Uh, so I will let uh, uh, Dr. Furge take it away and please put your questions in the Q&A. Just one last thing there is, uh, we have enabled um, uh, subtitles uh, and, and if that is distracting to you, there is a feature on Zoom uh, that you can hide the subtitles uh, during this talk. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Schroeder. So um, James and I are just thrilled to be here today to discuss our work at both Stanford and the medtech industry. As is inherent with this type of work, um, with medical device innovation specifically, James and I have significant conflicts of interest and disclosures to make, but most importantly is Novonate, for which he's on the board of directors and I'm one of the consulting medical directors, and we both have ownership in the company. Uh, another company that we will talk about is Emmy, for which I'm a co-founder and have ownership as well. The rest of the conflicts are not relevant to this talk. For our agenda, we'll validate why innovation in pediatrics needs special attention and how the biodesign process can be applied to pediatric health technology innovation using a case example from Stanford Children's. And then we'll examine opportunities for involvement. So if you're interested, please stick around towards the end because uh, we'll be talking a lot about our vision for the future of innovation at Stanford. So first, I want you to grab a pen and paper or start writing in the chat if you uh, feel inclined to do that. And we'd love to just take a couple minutes to think about the last 24 hours and think about what medical devices that you've used to care for your patients. And then furthermore, what medical devices your patients have used in their own care and just list them out. We're gonna give you a couple minutes to do that. 
So Janine, I'm going to go first and share that in the last 24 hours, I used um, surgical stapler, surgical instruments, retractors, pretty much all of which were made for adults and uh, none of which are approved. So all off label uh, in the operating room for the most part. So some of you might be struggling to come up with a device or two, but just remember, it's really easy to forget that we use them all the time and we really use them on a daily basis and so do our patients. Great, some of our radiologists are, are sharing that they uh, use a lot of really expensive stuff. Um, MRI, uh, CT, also talking about uh, PACs, which is how we share radiology, all things that had to be you know, developed and uh, made for us. Those are great examples. Anyone think about any simpler devices? So I'll give you some of them. So you might've considered simpler ones, um, but even a blood pressure cuff is a medical device, something that we don't think about that frequently and keep them coming if you'd like. I'm just gonna uh, keep going through. Now, of course, um, the push comes after the silence. So we got otoscopes, <laughs> full stops, and trach, and even a pen light ophthalmoscope. It's awesome. Oh, good. Love it. Uh, so nobody, I think, said inhaled medication spacer yet, um, but that's pretty simple, but it's, it's still a medical device. And some of you certainly thought about more complex things, um, but thinking about like continuous glucose monitoring or even implantable devices. Diagnostics are certainly realistic as well. So this implantable device uh, specifically is a Piccolo device. It's used for the patent ductus arteriosus um, for premature neonates. So sometimes it, we're so heavily reliant on, on medical devices, but imagine if none of those existed and how challenging it would be to care for our patients. We wouldn't be able to do any uh, MRIs or CTs or, or even check their blood pressure. So it's hard to imagine our world without them but we also don't really think about how they're developed very often and how they got there. So it's important to understand that for each one of these devices, no matter how simple or complex they are, someone had to have more than an idea. They had to understand the market opportunity, they had to develop a business plan, they had to engineer a device and build a team, build a quality system, get FDA approval, and perhaps even gather clinical evidence. So each one of these devices requires a significant amount of time, energy, and capital investment to reach your patients and a very thoughtful process along the way. But this is a process we really rarely talk about in academia, but truly we do need to understand it, um, especially this innovation and commercialization pathway if we wanna to continue to be able to provide innovative therapies that ultimately benefit our patients. And we also, as pediatricians, need to understand that devices aren't always designed with pediatric patients in mind. So this example is near and dear to my heart. Um, it is a laryngoscope blade that's used for intubation. And the smallest one is used for down to a 22-week um, gestational age neonate, which could be less than 500 grams. And the largest is for a large adult. And what they often do is devices are simply made smaller to accommodate children and premature neonates rather than taking in their unique physiologic features in mind. For example, the neonatal airway is significantly more anterior than even an older child is, and their tissues are more easily damaged with the metal blade. But alternatively, there are certain conditions for which disease specific solutions are required and developed mostly because those conditions don't occur in older adults um, or adolescents. So one recent innovation is the one pictured here, is the Piccolo device for um, patent ductus arteriosus occlusion in premature neonates. It's specifically designed and tailored uh, to permit closure into neonates up to two kilos. And they administer this via cardiac catheterization rather than surgery, which was previously performed through a lateral thoracotomy. Obviously they had a lot more mor morbidity that. So I hope you're starting to get that products for children should look and function differently than adults. But regardless of that point, the data show that the products for children just aren't being developed for them at all. So not only are pediatric devices 10 years behind, but the gap is only getting worse. 
Device approvals are stagnant for pediatrics as evidenced by this, these green bars and accelerating for adults as evidenced by the purple bars going upwards. And even more disconcerting is that most of those devices that are approved for pediatric patients are actually for patients 18 to 22 years old, which we don't even consider to be pediatric patients for the most part. And then here's a strong visual example of the disparity between adult and neonatal um, line securement. So there truly is this shocking inequity between adult and pediatric devices. And that's evidenced here by a PIC line and PIC line securement. So for adult central line management, it is protective, it's standardized, it's simple. We use it all the time. But on the right side is the gold standard for neonatal umbilical central line securement. It's a tape bridge. It's made from non-sterile tape kept at the bedside, which really is an arts and crafts project that leaves the central line exposed and prone to line migration. And not to mention it's located right next to the diaper, which likely contributes to this increase in central line infections. So it leaves these lines exposed, um, adhered with non-standardized tape, and it's really an ineffective solution. But we really have to ask ourselves, why does this inequity still exist? And how are we tolerating this? And it's because industry spends more money to develop technologies that address the last month of life than on technologies that can transform a lifetime. I'm just gonna let you sit with that for a second. The med tech industry just really isn't designed to promote pediatric device development, nor are they motivated to do so. So I wanna take a deeper look into the challenges that are unique to pediatrics. And they really can be divided into four broad categories. So funding, engineering, ethical concerns and regulatory concerns. So the most commonly cited reasons in our industry are around orphan indication. It's too small of a market. It's too niche of a product. There are too few investors who want to specifically invest in, in pediatrics or it's seen as philanthropy. Go back for one second. However, there are certain diseases as we tried to make the case for, for persistent patent ductus arteriosus such as gastroschisis or respiratory distress syndrome or congenital diaphragmatic hernia, among many others, where they don't occur in adults. So the really specific development for pediatric patients needs to be um, dealt with. And for engineering, there are real issues. There are real engineering concerns. So it must accommodate dramatic growth, especially if you have an implantable device that's supposed to last from the time someone's a premature neonate all the way through the time that they're an adult. Um, or even a smaller amount of that. And, it, and if you're talking about blood pressure cuffs or something um, that's not implantable, then you do have to have a variety of different sizes for the variety of different children because there really are developmental differences. We all know that pediatrics is not homogeneous. Ne neonates are not the same as adolescents. 22 week gestational age neonates are certainly not the same as 22 year olds in any way, shape or form but they're a lot less homogeneous than the adult population, which is easier to develop for. And then just designing on a smaller scale is an engineering concern. It's harder to build a smaller device than it is to build a larger device. And there's overall less tolerance for discomfort. We don't want our patients to necessarily have implantable devices that are painful if, if we don't need to. And so it does limit the potential for solutions for product development. And ethically, obviously there's a heightened concern for potential harm to our patients, especially ones that have an inability to self-advocate. In terms of regulatory, there's a high burden of evidence required for FDA approval and a high risk of lifelong injury resulting in large liability damages for the company. And so I imagine this all really sounds quite insurmountable. And why would you ever even try to do this? Um, but the good news is that at Stanford, we really are starting to figure out a repeatable way of developing ideas from Stanford clinicians and turning them into pediatric devices that actually reach patients. So these are three unmet needs and they were identified by three separate Stanford children's faculty. They use Stanford resources, early stage grant funding, and were very capital efficient. And they were all able to get private investments to commercialize their ideas and reach patients. The first is Novonate, and it was founded um, with a team by Dr. James Wall, and it's now standard of care in our NICU. We no longer have the tape bridge as the standard of care. 
It's the way we protect umbilical central lines from infection and migration, really trying to narrow that equity gap. The next company is Emmy that I co-founded and it's a commercially available software hardware combination device that helps adolescents on birth control pills avoid unplanned pregnancies. And it was just named the number four most innovative wellness company of 2021 behind Peloton and the Calm app. And the last is Tuio, which was founded by Dr. Bronwyn Harris, a residency colleague of mine, and now pediatric cardiologist. It's an app and a hardware sensor placed under the bed that revolutionized asthma home monitoring and exacerbation detection. They conducted a successful clinical trial that resulted in an acquisition by Apple. So developing three commercialized products, it's impressive, but it didn't just happen overnight. We all use the repeatable and sustainable Stanford biodesign process and adapted it to innovate in pediatrics specifically. So for those of you that don't know, Stanford biodesign is a center on campus and it's physically located on the first floor of the Clark Center. When we come back to campus, you're welcome to come visit. And we aim to be a global leader in advancing health and technology innovation to improve lives everywhere. While 90% of university products take an emerging technology and then they search for a clinical need or use case, biodesign flips that on its head and does the complete opposite. We start with a very well-defined need and then develop the technology around that. However, this is this may seem very subtle, but everyone underestimates the amount of time it takes to truly understand and develop insights into a compelling unmet clinical need. Um, I teach the Biodesign Faculty Fellows course and I tell them this in the beginning, but they never believe me. And now we're about four months in and they're starting to believe me how long it really, really takes to understand. Because as clinicians, we see these needs all around us, but there are many more factors that go into understanding the need than what's on the surface. So not only do you need to understand the pathophysiology of the condition, but the cycle of care, stakeholders, competitive landscape, the market potential, and so on and so on. And this diligence early on in the process truly sets you up for success years later. So there are three stages to this process, identify, invent, and implement. And I'll walk you through those with a pediatric case example that came out of the biodesign program. So for needs finding, we start by finding many, many different needs. So often over 200 of them or more. And this is done through clinical immersions. You may sometimes see our teams um, in the clinic, in the hospital, observing unmet clinical needs and, and jotting them down and interviewing all of you. So to turn to an example, I love this example because it shows that needs can truly be found anywhere. Um, this team was staying at a friend's house and they heard their child having night terrors. And it was so shocking and upsetting to them that they ended up uh, formalizing it, that observation into a formal need statement. And the way we do that is through this need statement. So a way to blank a problem in a blank population in order to facilitate an outcome. And their need statement was a way to treat night terrors in children in order to decrease nights with awakenings. So to hopefully have them sleep through those night terrors and really treat the night terrors. And this came after multiple iterations. We didn't just come up with this on the first time. And we use this need statement like a prototype as a way to communicate a need or idea with others and it should be iterative and it should generate feedback. So you may have people come to you and talking about these needs. In terms of need screening, as I, as I mentioned, we try to generate many different need statements. So maybe over 200 of them and allow them to compete and screen for the most compelling unmet clinical need because you can't just go after the first problem you think of. And the reason that you can't do that is because you're actually gonna spend the next 10 years of your life on this project. So it's really critical to take a look at many different needs and understand which project is really worth spending your time and energy and likely the next 10 years too. And the screening process gives you a sense of the landscape and opportunities that are available out there. So after need screening, when you identify your need statement, you come up with need criteria. 
must have criteria and nice to have criteria. And these criteria allow you to determine the features necessary for your solution. And they really are there to understand what a minimal viable product is. And what I love about this, that's actually subtle, but very hard to do, is that throughout the stage, you're just listening to the customer, the clinicians, and the stakeholders to see what features are necessary to be successful. And up until this point, innovators have been completely solution agnostic. So we don't allow them to talk about solutions, and we just stay in the need and truly try to understand that. It's really easy to say, but it's actually very difficult to do in practice. And then we brainstorm. So this is the time everyone loves because we let them think about solutions and concepts. And the way we brainstorm is for volume. It's without judgment. We generate as many ideas as possible, not necessarily fully formed concepts. We filter down to the most promising ideas and compare concepts to the needs criteria to ensure that the must-haves are satisfied because if they're not, then they don't pass through the screening criteria. And I'd be remiss not to mention that screening is iterative. So it doesn't just happen once and you come up with the, the solution that you want. Um, you, they learn more about intellectual property, regulatory landscape, reimbursement strategies, business models, concept exploration and testing. And as you learn more and more about these concepts, you further screen and refine to a final concept that you wanna bring forward to the market. And really that's just the beginning. So we get to the implementation phase, and that's a stage that biodesign fellows start when they're in biodesign, but they um, then need to develop this, and they do that to develop the strategies necessary to build a successful business, but the stage doesn't end with the fellowship or in a few months. It continues for many years afterwards. If we look back at the Night Terror Group, they decided to develop a company called Lully, and they have an app paired with hardware that senses early night terrors and creates a vibration that slightly awakens the child, but not enough to really awaken them, but enough to halt the night terror. And they were able to meet their outcome because they found that they were able to reduce night terrors by 80%. So in the past 20 years, these are all the companies that Biodesign has put out. They've generated 52 med tech companies, but it's really important to know that only four of them have pediatric indications. And we're talking about all of them here. And likewise, in 2019, over 2.7 million patients have been helped by Biodesign originated technology, which is an amazing feat. And post pandemic, it's up to four to 5 million now and growing exponentially, but only a very small amount of those have been children. So I want to dive into a little bit deeper into um, a successful pediatric device company that came out of biodesign that's on that list of four. And it's been specifically designed for the neonatal population to address this inequity. So a Stanford student team was actually initially assigned adult central line management and found that the problem had largely been solved in adult patients and they found themselves in the NICU. And then they noticed this unbelievable inequity between adult patients and neonatal central line securement. Now, I have to say this is something that I saw for years and didn't even think twice about. And it's shocking when you look at these pictures that I didn't think twice about this, but it was just the way that it's done. And it's, it's not something that we thought to change because we didn't have any tools to change it with. But the student team recognized that this unmet need and formulated their thoughts into the following need statement to solve this inequity. So a way to protect umbilical catheters and neonates in order to decrease central line associated bloodstream infections. So they were really going after CLABSIs. And the reason this matters is because 15 million babies are born prematurely every year around the world and 300,000 of them are admitted to NICUs across the United States. And a significant amount of the costs, but also the revenue um, in US hospitals and US children's hospitals specifically is spent on premature neonates. And these umbilical cords are the lifelines for the patients. So just as a, as a little review, umbilical cords consist of two arteries and one vein. And 
umbilical catheters are the fastest and most reliable way to gain central access to a critically ill newborn in the first few minutes to hours to days of life. And umbilical venous catheters are primarily used for emergency access for fluid and medication administration, blood draws, ongoing um, TPN use. And the arteries are generally used for measurement of PaO2 and continuous monitoring of arterial blood pressure. So these catheters are painless for the patient. They avoid um, having to insert a pick, which at our institution is actually a pretty easy thing to do because we have a wonderful VAD team and um, we have an RT RNTS support in the NICU. But in most places, it's actually quite difficult to find someone skilled enough to do that. Um, but the real problem is, is that umbilical catheters, despite being how wonderful they are, they're removed after five to 14 days due to malposition or the fear of future complications such as infections. And so this ineffective securement um, leads to migration. And we found in the literature that 46 to 68 percent of umbilical venous catheters migrate within the first 24 hours of life. And this has significant consequences. Not only do you have to get x-rays every single time that you reposition, um, but there can be liver injury if the line is too low, pericardial effusions if the line is too high that can result in significant mortality, cardiac arrhythmias, necrotizing enterocolitis, um, or this urgent need to put in a pick line. And, and while line migration can result in these significant adverse events, you can also imagine if the line is moving into the patient from an unsterile, um, external environment, it could also be taking bacteria with it. So while we still wanted to reduce CLABSIs, um, but thankfully they are such rare events that we needed to find a surrogate marker that was meaningful to facilitate clinical study endpoints and line migration. So this is just a little bit of the prelim work that they've done with um, Oregon Health and Sciences University, as well as Packard, looking at just an observational studies of life bubble being on patients and it significantly reduced the number of malposition. When compared to historical control group at OHSU, went from 44% of patients had at least one line migrate to 12% with life bubble. So I'm sure you're wondering what this looks like, but this is what it looks like. Um, this is the life bubble and then this is a video uh, showing how it's used. You can put both catheters through the center of the device loop it around the posterior knobs, and then secure it by lifting the tab over the knob. It's FDA registered and commercially available and accommodates um, any size catheter that we need. So the final design, while it looks beautiful now, it actually took many device iterations and prototypes prior to landing on this um, final concept. So among other things, they had to consider shape, design, materials, transparency, securement, the breathability of it. Um, and then all of those things were tested in prototypes leading to these variety of prototypes. But what we're really proud of is that this design development, um, device development was truly a collaborative effort between Stanford clinicians, nurses, engineering students, staff and faculty, um, because the biological work was done using actual neonatal umbilical cords to determine bacterial accumulation and they were able to access those from our NICU. The catheter securement testing was performed in lab space in the Sri Ram building on campus. If you've ever gotten over there, it's a beautiful part of campus on the engineering side. Um, and the rate at which fluid flows through the catheters while secured and pressure generated was also tested on campus. And then finally, our wonderful NICU staff, especially our bedside nurses, gave feedback and interacted with multiple generations of prototypes. Um, and if they hadn't had access to all of this and these vast array of Stanford resources, the team wouldn't have been able to decrease the inherent risk of this device and be able to attract venture funding and now actually be on patients. So this is, this is what they did in Stanford and started with a very small team, internal grants, access to the NICU. And this is what they've done since. So I think Novonate in and of itself is a wonderful example of this student project that taking a lot of resources and advisement, support and hard work was eventually able to spin out of the university. But we really need to emphasize that even for this relatively simple class one device, um, it's important to acknowledge that it took over eight years and significant capital investment to reach patients. But after eight years, 
It's reached over 500 patients and counting. And that's why it's really important to put in the time, the diligence, the energy and the effort early in the stages to get the need right so that you spend the next eight years or more working on the right project. So I'm gonna stop sharing and turn it over to James. Thanks, Janine. I'm gonna pull up my PowerPoint here and we'll go into presenter mode. Um, I'm gonna speak for just a few minutes about really um, two fundamental things that we believe are necessary to advance pediatric innovation. One is education. And we're gonna talk about those opportunities, how to learn process um, and network in order to be able to innovate. And then second, enablement, real resources like seed funding, uh, consultants, et cetera, that, that we are working to provide. So I'll start from a faculty perspective. Uh, I will also speak to residents and med students as well, but beginning from the faculty side, if you wanna get involved in innovation, our partnership with MCHRI has really been a fantastic way to do that. Um, MCHRI helps to fund um, six pediatric faculty members a year to join our uh, Biodesign Faculty Fellowship Program. That program caters to faculty in that it's once a week in the evening over an eight month period. Janine is one of the uh, faculty members who uh, helps run that program. And it really takes faculty members through the process of innovation translation, teaches about things that you don't learn in medical school like FDA regulatory pathways, reimbursement, et cetera. And it allows you to take potentially some of the research interests you have apply the biodesign process and understand if they may be opportunities for translation and commercialization. Uh, it's so wonderful to see all these familiar faces from uh, who, who have helped me take care of, of children over the years. And you can see a broad diverse array of, of pediatric specialists, cardiology, pulmonary, psychiatry who have uh, been part of the program. Um, and from that program, we've had a number of, sorry to go back, a number of great projects that have come out, weight control projects, um, tools for diagnosing ear infections um, and, and an ICU project around decreasing pressure related injuries. These are all in various levels of development, but really exciting opportunities that were sharpened by being part of the faculty fellowship program. So if you do have an interest, um, there is a information session coming up on March 22nd. So do register for that. You can find that on the biodesign website. I'll also mention from a faculty perspective that I believe innovation projects are academically productive. Uh, I also think that innovation can be the cornerstone of an academic career. So, you know, doing the faculty fellowship is not a distraction that ends up getting you involved just in commercialization. I believe it can lead to real academic productivity that's important. You know, the university has a mission to, um, for, fundamental discovery, but part of that mission is also to translate it. So understanding that process is really important. There's a, a growing array of internal grants from foundations like Coulter, um, Spectrum and MCHRI also support specific technology grants. There's a growing number of external grants as well as opportunities in philanthropy. And those lead to, of course, publications, national reputation. And there's a growing number of innovation programs around the country. I have visited places from Minnesota to Michigan to Duke and those programs need faculty members who know how to do this. Um, has that quite gotten to the a and promotion committee? I think it's coming. Uh, I think other universities are even ahead on this in considering things like patents and external funding uh, as the equivalent of publications and um, grant funding. So I, you know, in terms of an academic productivity, I think innovation can, can really drive great projects um, that can help in career development. If you're not a faculty member, so speaking to residents, fellows in the audience, medical students, there's a lot of other offerings from the biodesign program to uh, learn the process. We have a full-time fellowship, uh, which I direct, which is a 10 month program. And that really attracts innovation teams. We take clinicians who are typically either in residency or fellowship between or just after, but somewhere in that training cycle uh, we combine them with engineers who usually have graduate degrees and a few years of experience, and we add people with industry background, business experience, MBAs, et cetera. Those teams are given full access to our healthcare system. We typically pick a disease state each year. Last year we did ENT, for example. 
we have now um, really made a concerted effort that the fellows not only observe on the adult side, but every year that we do a disease state, we make sure to engage them with the pediatric faculty. Uh, and thank you to all of you who have been part of that and hosting our fellows. So this fellowship is available and something to really consider if you're in the residency fellowship and are thinking about innovation as a career. It's um, very in-depth and, and people who come out of it um, overwhelmingly have careers that are involved in, in medical technology. Uh, there's also courses if you want to kind of dip your toes. There's innovation courses both at the undergraduate and graduate level. Um, and the graduate level course particularly looks for medical students to join MBA students and engineering students uh, in, in learning the biodesign process and doing projects. Finally, the, the Center for Biodesign does support translation through research grants. And I mentioned a few of those already, but we do administer the Coulter program, Spectrum, net, more recently Neuroscience Translate. And, and our approach to these is really judging projects, not just on the scientific merit, as many grant funding uh, opportunities, but really on their translation potential. So projects really have to have both the scientific um, cornerstone as well as a clear plan to be able to get to a sustainable product that can get to patients. So now shifting gears a little bit to enablement. So those were kind of the educational offerings from faculty to students. Um, but education is not enough. We also think that we need to enable pediatric device development. and We've begun this work and there's more to do, but we formed the Pediatric Device Consortium in conjunction with UCSF, normally our fierce competitor, but for the sake of children, you know, regional strength is important. Um, we were able to get funding from the FDA, who as lobbied by the American Academy of Pediatrics based on the flat line of pediatric device development, have begun funding consortiums to try and generate a pipeline of new products for children. We were able to match that funding from the Cottrell Foundation last year. And this really allows us to begin to bring resources to clinicians and projects and ideas. And we do this in three different tiers. Tier one is our innovator forum, which everybody's welcome to join. And I'll give you information in a second. Um, but the innovators forum is really catered to anyone from a clinician who maybe just sees a need and doesn't even have an idea yet to someone with an idea, to someone with a prototype to even a company that has a fully fleshed out adult product, but wants to apply it to children. So the Innovators Forum combines both Stanford and external experts across engineering, regulatory, et cetera, and really offers people feedback. We do it with a code of conduct that maintains confidentiality for innovators. And you really get to hear from a multi multidisciplinary team of people who have been involved in development about what the opportunities and, and challenges may be ahead of you. If you're interested in taking that idea or concept forward, we offer coaching to understand market opportunities, regulatory pathway and payment. And we also offer consulting services for those specific areas. And then finally, we have a seed funding program where we're now able to give away almost $400,000 a year, mostly in our pitch competition, which we'll highlight at the end, which is coming up uh, in a couple of weeks. And that attracts pediatric projects from around the country to pitch and try and gain seed funding to develop their devices for children. Specifically, the Innovators Forum, you can find information on this as well as the pitch competition at our website, pediatricdeviceconsortium.org. Uh, if you want to come to the forum, you can sign up. And again, it's really open to anybody across the spectrum, students to faculty. Again, anything from unmet need all the way up to fully developed project that you want to apply to pediatrics. Uh, there's uh, just to mention that there's forums for both UCSF and Stanford. We'd love to, of course, hear what you're up to here at Stanford, but you, it's also access to the UCSF group and we work together as a leadership team to, to develop all of these projects. Um, so has it worked? Well, in two years, I think we're very proud of, of the work we've done with the Pediatric Device Consortium and we want to grow it. So in the last two years, the Stanford-based portion of the, of the programs looked at 23 different innovations. Um, and this includes our pitch competition. Um, we've supported those in, in various ways. Ultimately, those projects have already touched 13,000 patients, even though the majority of them aren't even clinical yet. They, these projects employ people, they've raised private capital. 
And we're still small enough and nimble enough that last year when COVID hit, we were able to immediately deploy resources to three projects, uh, including uh, a very low cost ventilator that was considered important early in the pandemic. And that ventilator, because of our involvement, initially they weren't considering making it um, pediatric and specifically neonatal compatible. But with our uh, involvement, we were able to convince them that they should do it for children as well. Ultimately, of course, we saw that COVID ventilators aren't really the best treatment for COVID, but the development of that product, I think, shows that our influence is important. So really proud of what we've been able to do. These are some examples of, of some of the projects that have been at the highest level of seed funding and pitch competition. Um, winner from last year was Eclipse for Genesis, which originally originated at UCLA and is now part of a research program at Stanford and translating out. That's a really a, a medical device approach to a really difficult orphan problem of short gut syndrome, where children, as many of you know, with short gut end up on lifetime TPN, very expensive medications, very, and many of them go on to uh, liver failure and liver transplants. So the concept here is that by distraction or by putting pressure on the gut with uh, mechanical distraction, you can cause the gut to grow and not only grow, but add absorption, add the ability to come off of TPN. They've got great preclinical data and we were really happy to be able to support them in translation to uh, human use, which is expected in the next year. Uh, and in conjunction with our seed funding, they were able to raise additional money to do that. So many, many examples, I won't go into all of them, but I do encourage people to come to our uh, pediatric pitch competition, which is coming up uh, in just a couple of weeks. One final note is, you know, putting the pediatric device consortium and future plans in the context of Stanford. Stanford's a large organization, and as, as everybody knows, and can be difficult to manage. Um, so right now, you know, the univer at the university and the school of medicine level, there has been a identification of the need for more translational uh, resources, that it is part of our mission and that we should be uh, doing that. So the Catalyst program, which is an evolution, is really uh, at the School of Medicine level focused on helping to translate promising projects from many verticals, including biotech, digital health, as well as classic devices, and really seed funding them to the point that they can gain escape velocity from the university and get out to patients. The one problem we see with the overall structure, and specifically even within the Biodesign Center, which we help to run, is that when you do a lot of these market analysis and needs finding early, there is a tendency to develop for large opportunities such as adult diabetes, adult stroke, cardiovascular disease. And without intentional specific work to develop a pipeline of pediatric products, they tend to early on be uh, weeded out based on opportunity. So we really think that it's important for us to continue the PDC work and even expand that. Um, we're looking to build a program that we've kind of prototyped the name Ascend to really generate competitive pediatric maternal and fetal health projects so that they can work their way through the larger ecosystem at Stanford and within the Valley and, and really develop companies that address the needs of our patients um, within this infrastructure. We think based on the Novonate example that it can be virtuous. Um, and Novonate I think is a great example of something that was observed here by the student team as Janine eloquently told the story, used biodesign resources, was assisted by Packard uh, faculty, nurses, clinicians, used university resources, was able to get private investment trials. Some of the trials were done here. And ultimately, I believe it will show a return on investment. There's cost savings from decreasing complications. There's quality improvement. There's staff engagement. And there's also the potential for real financial returns as the IP is owned by Stanford. And as the Catalyst program considers how to potentially invest in these types of projects, there's a potential for a return on equity as well. So ambitious plans for the future are to continue with what the PDC does now, which is really in the middle category of helping with translation. We also want to increase the opportunities for education, which has been done in conjunction with MCHRI. And we have a, an eye towards policy as well. And for those of you 
who are familiar with more of the biotech side, you know that there's been a really great legislation, legislative and, and financial rewards for developing orphan drugs. The same just isn't true for devices. And we think that there's a real opportunity um, at that level to encourage medical device development for kids. Uh, a prototype that we're starting this year uh, as we expand the PDC and try and move towards this larger pediatric pipeline of projects is to do an innovation initiative at the Johnson Center, one of the, the four major centers within Packard. We have uh, put our resources towards an entrepreneurship innovation team that is really exploring needs in the Johnson Center. And again, thanks to all the faculty out there who are helping to host them and, and share your unmet needs with them. Their mission is to develop a couple of really good project opportunities. And those project opportunities are things that we would love to share with faculty members, residents, fellow students, and have people um, really who are interested join those efforts and, and try and repeat um, the success we had with Novanate and other, uh, other projects that have come out. Uh, the team that we have behind it now, really proud of. Um, we've got faculty members across pediatrics. We have people with expertise in, in business um, as well as engineering expertise. And uh, I think that this team's gonna develop some really great project ideas. I wanna give a special thanks to Juliana Pearl who helped us with this presentation, is currently a, a graduate student in ms and &E and is, is really, um, the fuel behind helping us make this presentation look great. So thanks to Juliana for that. We also have a great partner in Charlotte Stallworth from the executive side. Um, so I'm gonna finish the presentation with our information. Um, you can reach out to either one of us at any time and I hope we'll be able to reopen the chat or I think we might just be using the Q&A. So if anyone has questions, I'll prompt you now to start thinking about those. Uh, I think the Q&A is still open. And finally, just share with you that our pitch competition is coming up. So if you uh, are interested in seeing, you know, exciting and new developments in pediatric innovation, please join us. You can scan to register right now on the QR code. Um, the top prize there is $100,000 in seed funding. And I think you'll really be impressed at the level uh, of sophistication and the level of development that we're seeing now in pediatrics and pediatric innovation. So. Huge thanks, uh, Alan, thank you. And, and thanks to, to Mary for inviting us to Grand Rounds. Um, it's been a real pleasure, so thank you so much. Thanks guys. Um, and I, I guess I believe uh, for the Q&A function now, you folks may not be able to see the questions that are posted, but you still can submit. Um, I, I, maybe I'll start uh, by, James, you already answered uh, one of the first questions that, that asked about, you know, I think drawing some parallels to the COVID vaccine development, but it, it would, you know, we, I work in the PICU and we constantly are faced with this struggle of, you know, having to um, apply data from adults uh, to, to kids, um, whether it's drugs, whether it's devices, uh, maybe even uh, surgeries or other interventions. And how um, actually in, in, in the COVID pandemic has really highlighted that. I mean, we were really forced to uh, translate findings from adult, the adult world to the pediatric world. How would you say your innovation efforts, uh, the struggles, the challenges, how do they compare to other things like drug development? Yeah, I think the, you know, one of the fundamental difference I sort of alluded to with drug development is that there is this enormous financial incentive to develop orphan drugs. And it, it's in the format of um, really both regulatory and, and payment. But there's, if you develop a drug for an orphan um, indication, you get sort of a pass to the FDA um, that allows um, two things. One, it allows a quicker review of, an, a, of a big market drug and it allows, um, I believe it's an extra six months of exclusivity or something along those lines. You know, for something like a PPI, that's a billion dollar opportunity. So there really is this huge incentive on the drug side and we'd like to see more of that. So it is different. Of course, the regulatory path and reimbursement are completely different for drugs versus devices. Um, and so those are, you know, major differences. But I, I think at the very early stage of you know, determining where the needs are, what the impact is and what the opportunity is and picking the right opportunity because both of, you know, whether it's a drug or a device is gonna take a long time to develop. So picking the right opportunity early, which is 
really at the core of what biodesign is about is, is really important for both of those. Sorry, I'm muted. Uh, there's another question that just, I, I think you talked a little bit about how to get involved in the program, but uh, folks asking about volunteering, uh, how, how can uh, folks get engaged if, if they want to? Janine, you want to take that one? Sure, yeah, just uh, echoing a lot of what James already mentioned, but um, certainly with the Pediatric Device Consortium, if you're interested in pediatric medical devices, the best way is to have an idea uh, to bring it to us, and then we can talk through and coach you how to how to go take that to um, wherever you want it to go, whether it's to patients, commercialize it if you need help with clinical trials and things like that. We can explore those opportunities. Um, and then biodesign, just do the fellowship. And that's one of the best ways to really start to develop this amount of expertise. Um, certainly James and I both did it and did it after my neonatology fellowship, which was life-changing and certainly changed the course of my, my career. So, so yeah, we'd love to have people involved. Yeah, I think I would add that maybe the lowest touch way is if you're just interested in kind of seeing what's going on, um, feel free to join our innovators forum. Um, just as an observer. And you never know if a project is in your area of expertise or just area of interest, there's always a, a hunger for, you know, people who are working on these projects to have help, particularly from, you know, clinicians who really understand the front line. An interesting question just popped up about um, thanking, you know, talking about this is sorely needed work in, in neonatal and pediatric care. And asking if we can learn, you know, the extent to which we can learn from um, uh, animal models, small animals, um, in terms of maybe troubleshooting some of these devices. How 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 much do you use animal models? Yeah, I think it, you know it's it's project specific, and that's what also is fundamentally very different about devices. You know, drugs have a much more much clearer pathway because each one's unique and needs to go through you know, the standard phases of development. With devices, this, what, you're, what I believe this person's alluding to is a great idea is that you can often learn from what we, what we call predicates or devices that are close or do something similar, whether it be in adults or in veterinary medicine. And there is a real opportunity, I believe, both on the adult side and veterinary to take the evidence that's been, ga been gained there and use it to, you know, gain indications in pediatrics. And we just recently had a great success with that, where the FDA is more and more open to using what we call real world evidence, meaning basically we're all doing stuff off label. Let's just track it since we have the EMR now and we can generally do that. And if we, you know, if a device has actually been used successfully in peds and we can prove that with real world evidence, let's get an indication and allow it to be expanded more broadly and allow, you know, it to be actually marketed to pediatrics so they can get to more patients. Um, I think we'll try to take one more. I, I think you've alluded to this a little bit as well, but um, asking what are the biggest challenges in developing pediatric devices and asking about FDA approval. I, you, you talked about that a little bit, but anything else you, you want to add? Janine, you want to take that one? Sure. Um, so I think all the the challenges I briefly touched on, um, the one that's cited the most commonly is it's a small market. And really, we can't just overemphasize how much industry really isn't motivated to solve this problem. So it's important for us in academia to also really uh, dive into these needs and try to solve them um, with partnership with industry and de-risk them as much as possible so that it is attractive uh, to outside funding because you can't get these devices to pediatric patients without additional funding. Um, and then how is it a little bit different? The, if it's for a purely pediatric indication, the application fees are often waived um, through the FDA. So there's some slight incentives, but not necessarily, um, it doesn't push the device through necessarily. And then Alan, I was just gonna comment, there, there was one other question, I don't know if you saw it or not, but I think it's a, it's a really good one to tackle, which is the financial part of it. And someone asked about, you know, how much does Stanford receive? And, and that's something that I think needs to be really transparent because there's, you know, one of my mentors, Tom Fogarty, who people may have heard of, I love one of his quotes. It's that if you're not conflicted, you're probably not doing anything interesting. And I think it goes beyond just device development, but there is inherent financial incentives. And I think people need to be transparent and understand them. So pe someone asked about 
Stanford receiving uh, monetary returns on Life Bubble. And yes, absolutely, Stanford, because the resources were used, they own the IP. Generally, the what happens with IP is that there's a, an annual payment uh, in terms of a license, as well as a percentage of, of revenue made, that percentage is usually single digit, somewhere in the two to eight percent. Um, so, you know, a couple dollars per device sold is kind of the answer to that one. And then asking about whether students and nurses were compensated. And, and the answer is people who were highly involved in the project um, were compensated with some ownership of, of the company that came out. Um, and we do you know, for people who are highly involved in the design process, um, they do get paid consulting fees and other things like that. And I, I think those are all reasonable things and you have to be very transparent about them because you do want to, you know, you want people to be compensated for their time and you don't want to ask for volunteer work when the company has a potential to make money. So um, it's always tricky, um, but ultimately in the end, if, if everybody's kind of happy with their role in it, um, not to mention the ultimate impact that it has, I think, all these things can be managed, but you really have to be open and talk about them. Thanks for that, James. Um, and we had, uh, James had promised to use one of those guitars to play a song to, to close things out here, but um, we may be running short on time. Uh, thank you guys so much for uh, sharing all of your work with us. And thanks everyone for listening and joining us today. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University please visit us at med.stanford.edu.